Welcome to all of our Becoming Your Best podcast listeners, wherever you may be in the world today. This is your host, Steve Schallenberger, and I am so excited for our guest today. He is an award-winning scholar, professor, author, combat veteran, internationally recognized expert and advisor on urban warfare and other military-related topics. He's considered the world's leading expert on urban warfare, and he served in his advisor to the top four-star general and other senior leaders in the U.S. Army as part of a strategic research group from the Pentagon to the United States Military Academy. He uh, currently serves as the chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point and as host of the Urban Warfare Project podcast. He also serves as a colonel in the California State Guard with assignments to the 40th Infantry Division, California Army National Guard as the Director of Urban Warfare Training. Welcome, Colonel John Spencer. Steve, thanks for having me and thanks for reading all that. That was a mouthful. Yeah, my goodness, man, what a background. That is amazing. (laughs) I've I've had a blessed Army career and really a blessed life. Uh, I can tell some stories. Yeah, I'll bet you could. And and uh, first of all, before we get going, a, uh, a heartfelt thank for your thanks for your service to your country and all that you've given. Oh, thank you. It's, it's been an honor. It's, and, I, and I appreciate all the support all around the world, actually, but especially from Americans. Yeah. Amen. Well, everywhere you go, it's just great to give give the honor that's due. And we, we're, we appreciate it. Okay, well, before we get started, I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about uh, Colonel Spencer. Uh, And we've already told you, uh, like he said, that's a mouthful, that first group. And (laughs) but there's more serving over 25 years in the active army as an infantry soldier. Spencer has held ranks from private to sergeant, first class, second lieutenant to major. His assignments as an army officer included two combat deployments to Iraq as both an infantry platoon leader and company commander, a ranger instructor with the army's ranger school, a joint chief of staff and army staff intern, a fellow with the chief of staff of the army strategic studies group and co-founder strategic planner and deputy director of the modern war Institute at West Point. So John is one amazing guy. He holds a master's of policy management from Georgetown University. I mean, and his accolades go on and on. Uh, He lives in Colorado Springs. Uh, He was just before we started telling me about his wife, perhaps we'll have the chance to talk about her and some of her assignments. And three active, right in the middle of it, young children. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pretty fun. The, 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 the mouthful is, the, is, the, is those three. Ah, exactly. Well, John, to kick us off today, uh, just tell us about your, uh, you know, like your background and, and including any turning points in your life that have had a significant impact on you. Really, what's your story and how did you end up in the military? How did you make that decision and end up where you're at today? Yeah, well, thanks, Steve. Thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll try to keep it short, but yeah, I joined the Army at the age of 17. I actually joined at 16, and we say mom had to sign me away, uh, <laughs> but she signed the contract. I joined at 17, really out of a small town in Indiana, because I, you know, from a lower income family, really didn't see a path after high school and, and agreed with what the Army you know, the army message about giving you something else. And I really joined with no idea what was ahead of me. And I just had a, a blessed career from my first duty station in Panama, Panama city, Panama, as a, you're coming out of Indiana. What a, what an amazing opportunity that gave me. Uh, and then I, you know, led a, a full army career, had two amazing opportunities, had great bosses. I learned something from everybody that I, I was with, but really it was opportunities. And I, I think I've had a unique and unique army his, kind of story, but then to go to combat, I, you know, lots of people serve in the army, never get the chance, but I, I, I was a part of the 2003 invasion. I actually jumped out of a helicopter in Northern Iraq for the 
invasion into Iraq, uh, liberated the country from an evil dictator. Uh, you had a, a whole year there, came back and then returned to Iraq in 2008 into Baghdad, a very urban, you know, a, a basically a whole nation under about to hit civil war, a very interesting time, you know, key assignments, and then finished out at West Point, actually teaching at the United States Military Academy. I, had, I met my wife actually in Iraq, which is its own story. I met my wife in Iraq and she was teaching at West Point as well. Really where I learned what I, you know, the dream job that I have now is because of that last assignment. I helped stand up a research center, learned about how writing can change your life, learned about how to ask the right questions, how to do research. So now I have a dream job where I travel the world studying war, um, get to talk to amazing people all around the world, get to go on TV and talk about things like Ukraine that we're seeing now, um, writing books. And I just had a book come out, you know, on July 1st, I have another one coming out in a few months from now. Um, an amazing life. Uh, some of my friends say, you gotta pull up a chair, grandpa, tell us some stories. Uh, but a lot of it's just opportunities that I've been given. Sometimes you got to take the opportunities you've been given. Um, but such an amazing life after joining the army at 17 and not knowing where life would take me. Wow. Okay. Well, that is quite the story. So like if you have uh, young men or women, like about that age, uh, is this something they ought to look at? Like, let's talk about that just for a moment. I think so. I mean, I think it wasn't, I mean, the army has so, or the military, I won't constrain it to my army blood, but the military just has so much opportunity for people in the teaching them about the world, teaching them about leadership, teaching them about how the world works, really opening the aperture. And it can be for a short amount of time, or it can be like, like me who decided to make it a career. Not everybody has to, but I, I've been blessed by meeting people from all around the world, just being in the military, but also learning about the world, how it works, uh, you know, seeing the world through much more uh, you know, of a broader spectrum, because I've traveled the entire world, lived in Italy, you know, have traveled to countless countries and, and seen the world. I don't know of any other profession that gives you that opportunity, but I mean, there's lots of paths people can take, but yeah, absolutely, if I was talking to you know, 17 year old, 16 year old people like I was, um, I would unfortunately pass the message that, that I was given about the great adventure that somebody can find if they, you know, spend a little time with the U.S. military. And it, and it is an opportunity to give back, right? We live in the best country in the world. And I can say that after having traveled the world. And sometimes you don't know why you live in the best country. Um, one of it is because of the people that serve in the military that are there serving for the country so that it can continue to be the greatest country in the world. And of course, we have our ups and downs and issues that, but it is because that we're so great that we can then approach those issues and tell, I tell you, I've been around the world and there's, I've never been so grateful for living in the greatest world in, in the greatest country in the world until I've traveled the world and seen what other people don't have. Okay. And so if there's a young person in that range, 16, 17, what advice do you have for them as they consider that option? Yeah, they have to weigh all their options, right? Um, the pros and the cons. And, and what I said and what I did um, and what I tell people to do is to do their research. So just like when somebody's researching what college they want to go to, and, and that's, of course, that's an amazing opportunity, but you always have to do your research. So whether if it's which service or the pros and the cons of, the, of going into the service for a short or long amount of time um, is really, they have to do their research. Don't listen to one person or one group of friends. They have to make their own decision. Okay, good advice. That's really good advice. Okay, well, let's shift to your book, uh, Connected Soldiers. Is that the one that's just coming out now? Yeah, it came out on July 1st, actually. So we're right in the throes of it. Hey, like uh, it's the ninth or something like that, just a week, about a week ago. Tell us about your book. Uh, why did you write it and what's in it? Sure. So I, one, I, I, so that's been one of the hardest questions. Why did I write it? So I, I learned towards the end of my career that I had experienced a lot of 
things in my life, but there were a lot of people that wanted to hear it. And I really, from being at West Point and being around those motivated young people, the cadets, they always wanted to hear this, the real stories of leadership. Um, you, you can be taught leadership, but to, to, to actually put that in context of whatever stress, whatever adversity. So that's probably the main motivator on why I wrote it. I mean, Connected Soldiers is, a, is first and foremost a memoir of my the ups and downs of my uh, of my leadership time in combat. So both in my 2003 deployment and my 2008 deployment. But I also put in there my 2018 experience where my wife, who's in the military, went off to war and I stayed at home and, let, and, and basically took care of our three kids while she was at war because every individual, and when I kind of, I put the academics, right? I'm an academic, so it's hard for me not to do research and then weave that in through my own experiences. So the book is about this, the way war has changed, the way the world has changed, and that we live these virtual lives and that telecommunications and social media has changed everything from your work life to how you know, we lead everything and how we lead our lives. But you know, what war taught me and what I try to explain in the book is that we are social beings. We need physical connections and there are important things that we've learned in history that work both in war and in our lives that we can't forget about. And my book came out, you know, I wrote it before COVID, but COVID, I think, just reemphasized and showed me again why some of the messages in my book became so important is that we aren't virtual beings. And we, we went into the virtual world because we had to, um, but we also realized that we need physical connection. So in my book, it's about you know, the main thesis, of course, is, is that soldiers have to be cohesive teams to achieve their mission. Um, and we've learned that in the history of war that cohesive teams can do great things. But what I found is that the line between home or the outside world and war is gone. There's no more, you know, writing letters and there's separation between what's going on in war and what's going on at home. So those worlds have collided. And that I, I, I show in the book, even in 2008, how that was having an impact because there's both positives and negatives in war and in life to having these social connections. But we can't forget the fact that we are, there are basic things that we have to hold on to even as we get more and more virtual. What I tell people is that we're, you know, we're more connected in our lives than we've ever been in history. But in some ways we're also more alone and that's dangerous. Mm. Yeah, I noticed the subtitle of your book is life, leadership, and social connections in modern war. Uh, I expect that uh, uh, you could also have life, leadership, and social connections, period. And there's a lot of overlap. So I'm really interested in talking about this. Uh, a couple of themes, if you don't mind, from your experience. Uh, yeah. First of all, on the point of leadership. Uh, I'm sure that you've had the opportunity in your military experience, whether it's on the battlefield or not on the battlefield to maybe be given an assignment where you did not have a co cohesive team. Maybe, maybe things, maybe it was a unit that wasn't performing very well. And, and I'm really interested, what can you do to bring exercise leadership, to bring a team together that hasn't been that way and get them on the right track? What have you found or you learned to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's my uh, the entire section of my book. Really, the majority of my book is my experience in 2008 of being flown into war to take a company that had been completely destroyed and was completely ineffective, and then just being put in as a new leader saying, okay, now fix it. While you're at war, so really, while the building the plane in flight, I was told to get in there and fix it all. And I, what, I tried to break down in the book how I I tried to, you know, within the military, there are military things, but like you said, a lot of it's just basic leadership. And the previous leadership had been so bad and had let the, the organization basically lower to the flies, create new type ways of doing things that were self-governing, no leadership, no purpose, no vision. Um, so I came in with this long list of things that needed to be done. But I, of course, had to prioritize. And I think that was, I had learned that in the military, but under the greatest amount of stress, it, it really gets exposed that you have to give people priorities. You can't tell them everything's important or nothing's important. So I had to go in 
and, I, and that's what I did. I brought everybody together, every subordinate leader on the night I was brought in and said, okay, look, day one, we're going to start anew, but we're going to start with these things are most important, like the protection of soldiers or really the number one thing, which I think translates to everybody is I said that nobody will go anywhere without knowing why they're doing what they're doing. Some people say, well, that's easy in war, but it actually isn't. So I would not let people go outside the wire or, you know, start the day without being told why they were being told to do something. So that, that became really the, the starting point. And those became priorities. And there were lots of things I had to fix. Um, but you, the organizations are made up of multiple levels of leaders. I actually always say, and I learned this from the military, that that day one, the first thing that a new leader has to do is assess. There's no way I don't want you can understand what's going on if you're not assessing. If you if the leader comes in, like if I would have came in and just started changing everything, it, it would have been too much. Uh, so I had to assess, and that's what I did. Uh, I I tried to assess, and then that way allowed me to identify the priorities um, of what was needed. And one of the biggest priorities I saw was that the organization had allowed informal leaders to take charge. So like in Lord of the Flies, which is a lesson of the, the ancient, you know, that book, that, that very old book is that without leadership, leaders will rise, power will be imposed. So I had to identify these informal leaders and I had to really remove their leadership power because there's many forms of power. We study that in the military, right? There's legitimate power. I can tell you what to do. That's really not the most powerful form of power. Like even in the military, people think that I can tell somebody to do it and they're going to do it. Well, you can read my book and figure out real quickly that that's not the way it works. Uh, people follow leaders because they respect them. They respect their expertise. And they know that they, they have authority. Uh, what I saw is these informal leaders that were using reverent power. So the younger people respected them. They thought they were cool. They, they think they all this. So I had, to, I had to reduce those individuals' ability to influence others. Yeah, so that has to do with creating the cohesive team, uh, which are much more powerful together than you are as an individual or, or diverse groups that are going different directions that diffuses your energy and strength. And, and that's one of the reasons I just love the 12 principles of highly successful leaders from becoming your best, which is based on 40 years of research, is whether you're on the battlefield or whether you're in uh, a, 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 an HVAC company or a coach, there are certain things you do that create this excellence. And uh, John, that's exactly what you did. You went in there and created a moral authority. You assessed, you listened, and then you created the vision and a plan. And then you're starting to get on your way. And of course, there's some other, and I, I'm sure you did the other things too. Uh, yeah, you know, as I look through that through that list, I, I I saw it all, or I saw. And if anybody reads my book, you'll see every every principle is there in some way or shape. Uh, it 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 is amazing. I mean, prioritizing your time, setting the vision, all of that. Uh, it, it's in there. It may not be titled that, but it, you'll see. No, that's right. Um, even the the giving your your a team has to have wins. So there's lots of translations to business and to sports into the military. So I, I knew as a leader, I had to figure out ways to get my team wins. Because like you said, a, a cohesive team is always going to be more effective. And there's two forms of cohesion. I break those down in the books. There's something called task cohesion and there's social cohesion. In the military, we need a lot of social cohesion because we need people so bonded that they're willing to face harm or die for each other. But in order to do the job, there's got to be task cohesion. They have to under they have to agree that the mission that they're trying to accomplish only can be done if they work together. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, absolutely, the principles, every one of them are there. Like you said, it, research shows it's all all there. It's all what needs to be done to create effective teams. Which even war, people think it's an individual act because we we, we read, we watch movies and things like that. But absolutely. It's, it's a group activity, and they're only successful when they're working effectively a part of a team. As you reflect back, John, uh, what's some of the most satisfying experiences you've had in the military? That's probably kind of a hard question to ask because there's not a lot of good things about war, right? But 
But I mean, if you look back and say, man, those are, there are some satisfying things that bring me satisfaction. What would some of those be? Yeah. So, I mean, I think 2008 really is both the highs and the lows of my entire 25 year career. Hmm. To be given a, a completely dysfunctional team, a team that the entire organization thought were the black sheeps, the bad news bears, you name it. Um, it literally, they had been taken out of the picture to be given that. Um, to form a team within them to where they respected me. They knew that I would, had their interests in, in, in my primary goals was their interest and in, um, protecting them when I needed to protect them. But then to take that within three months, really three months to turn them into the, the most effective team in the entire organization, the brigade to where we're being given the highest missions um, for so basically go from the last place to the first place and then one day my team and I wasn't even there uh, one of my subordinate teams captures one of the most important people in the entire Baghdad region by working as a team and each individual actually sacrificing themselves as in making a decision with no thought because they knew they were a part of this team it's all the definitions of cohesion so that day when they captured that guy of course, I got a lot of accolades, um, which I didn't transfer to them, but they had achieved so much in such a l little amount of time to go from the worst, to the best, using those principles to be sure. Um, but to see that, that was the greatest moment of my 25-year career was when that team achieved that. And I wasn't even there, there, but they achieved it because of what we had done as a team. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's, that is Awesome, isn't it? Fun to see that happening and because it makes a difference, not only then at that moment in the results that you get, but it's also in the lives of those people forever. In other words, they now see that and as they move forward out in the world, they realize that's what I should be doing. Yeah, I think this is what I learned too in my Army career and I never knew it until I reflected back is that we're all searching for an identity. Oh, um, yeah. Every person that I, I was looking for an identity and my people, understanding people, right? Because we're leading people, even and that's why you can't do it virtually. They're all searching for something, a meaning and a purpose. And being a part of that team, and it's really, everybody knows in the military, right? You see old guys with t-shirts and hats and because it becomes a part of their identity for the rest of their lives that they are a part of this special team. People, when they're even in a failing organization, they want to be a part of a great team. So as a leader, I had to understand not only that I wanted that, I wanted identity and purpose, but I had to give it to them. And that was a big part of where I spent my time was creating that identity, right? Creating our group identity so, so that our, our company was, you know, whether it's the motto that we used or whatever, so where that's the true aspect of cohesion when you start to identify yourself with the group more than you do all your individual identities. Okay, good. Well, thank you for that reflection. Now, you talked about uh, the world is at a whole new place in regards to military and warfare and family and the connection that you have. You said it will never be the same. Uh, do you mind talking about that? And how does that work? And what do you see as the best way to use that? Because I agree, I think it's a tremendously positive thing. Uh, uh, because you keep those connections close and they know what you're doing and you know what they're doing and that gives more meaning to life. But maybe you could just elaborate your perspective on that and how to use it in the right way. Sure. So it's, it's a double-edged sword is what I say. Um, so the connections between an individual and their family, it, it, it can be omnipresent now. We're seeing this in the Ukraine uh, where we can all watch battlefield on uh, in real time uh, and live cameras all of that mm. from the individual families that means i can i don't have to no, no longer wait for news about my soldier i can watch him i can watch on tv i can when in 2018 my kids could could facetime my wife almost every day unless she was in iraq or afghanistan um because but what it does is it causes the individual to have a have a foot in both doors so I have a foot in both worlds. So if you're at home, like I was, my family was experiencing war 
not only because we could watch it on TV, on the, on, on the internet, uh, but we were talking to the soldier every day. Same thing with the soldier. The now, soldier just time out just for a yeah. second. So our listeners know John's wife was a bomb disposal expert. Whoa. She and still so, is. Okay. So she still is. And so she was, so John came home from his deployment and she goes out and she probably still is. So that's a little background of what he's talking about being at home and she's out there. So what I, what I experienced in that experience, which is really what I'm trying to say in the book is that the, when the individuals have to lead in two worlds and it works in, in, in the business world as well, you know, business trips, all of this, um, there's both a huge positive, right? So no longer, we had 15 month deployments when I was in, um, and, and you change in a year, your family changes, the world changes, you go back and you feel it's really hard to get back because, so now we have the ability to, to be a part of our, our family's lives every day. But as an old soldier, I was trying to hold some things for my wife and she wanted none of that. She wanted to hear everything that was happening every day. Well, what I experienced in 2008 from leading soldiers who were receiving messages from home that would, would have taken months to get to them, like their, their pregnant girlfriend is, is having problems and that's affecting their ability to do their job. Mm. There used to be a time gap. Now there's not. So that meant as a leader downrange, and, and, and then later my wife had to deal with not only personal issues, but the personal things that are happening to my soldiers and my teams that could impact my ability to do my job where you need to be focused. So what I figured out as a leader in, in combat and uh, even with our family we do now is that even though they're connecting, you, you're connecting, you're leading multiple you live in multiple worlds right you live in these social media worlds for us it's war and, and, and home uh, and it impacts both but we still need connections so for our, my soldiers downrange, range when they came out of a, a stressful situation i made sure they they sat around together and talked about it mm. because i found that they were coming back from that experience and just immediately going online so in our family what we do is no matter what we're doing all day we still come together and at, you know, usually it's around the dinner table, which is you know biblical. It's, it's it's ancient that you form bonds at the dinner table, you break bread together. But as a family, we have a technology free, and it, it translated to the military the same. When the militaries eat together, they sleep together. If building these bonds, you have to know the people you're serving with. Of course, in our families, we have to be a part of our family's lives every day, all day, and and, and that's my job as a mentor and a leader in my family. In the army, we want our leaders to be that as well. So you have to know, you have to spend time. Actually, um, there's two ways that you form bonds in people. One is you experience hard things together, whether that's a a great victory, like a like you win something, or or you've been to, you had a hard training event. It forms bonds, but research shows actually you form stronger bonds by just spending a lot of time together, learning about a person. It, where they know you understand them, you care about them. So, you know, if there's a lesson in the book, is that is that 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 attribute of leadership and of our daily lives won't go away, no matter how connected we become in our lives. So, I actually tell people just now to stay connected to what's most important, and that translates to war, to business, to our personal lives. Is you need to stay connected to your what's most important because we need it. We need it to perform our jobs, but you actually need it to live. Well, I love the different dimensions and the levels of thinking about connections. That's really a wonderful concept. And for the leader to be close enough to those that work together with him, that uh, he or she can be supportive of that person and create that, you know, that connection professionally. Uh, and you kind of help bring these worlds together so we can be better at everything that we do. Uh, I love the thought. Well, we're, we're so running out of time. I mean, I can't believe it. We've just been scratching the surface here today. You know, we're watching what's happening in U Ukraine. I'd be interested in your take on what's happening there. And, and I mean, especially in your field of urban warfare, we, 
read quite a bit about that. Do you want to comment on that at all? And then I'd like to wrap up with one other question. Yeah, sure. So we we all get to watch war now. We, you know, I, like like I said, we can watch Ukraine in a, in a way that nobody's ever been able to watch war. And really, what war is just the most stressful human experience that can ever be a person can ever go through. But what what has mattered the most in Ukraine is people. It's the motivations of the Ukrainian people. It's their will to fight. That's that's about leadership. It's a we're seeing one of the world's most memorable leaders in their president, but it goes all the way down to their, I just got back two weeks ago from their smallest groups. It's about people, not weapons, not technologies. It's about people fighting together. And that's what the Ukrainians have that the Russians don't. It's motivated, well-led groups, small groups, and they're going to win eventually. They're going to win. Wow. Yeah, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough thing. I know Russia is grinding it out on the eastern side over there, and it'll be interesting to see how this comes out. But I love your faith in the uh, the spirit of uh, and the hearts of people and the desire to be free. And and uh, yeah, well, thank you for that perspective. Any other thoughts on that before I hit my last question? <laughs> no, I mean this is a. I think Ukraine. My personal thoughts is a fight between good and evil, um, and people want to be good. Uh, so that's why you see Russian teams falling apart at the seams because you can't give them a purpose, right? Going back to leadership, you can't give them a purpose that's not just in their mind. It, they don't agree with it. Bad things start to happen. And that's what you're seeing on the Russian side. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, here's the last question. Been a great discussion today, John. Thank you so much. Uh, any final tips from our listeners that you would like to offer? My, my final tip is to understand, you have to understand yourself and you have to understand others that we're all searching for a purpose in life. Even in our, whatever job it is, we're bringing that, that, those thoughts to the day, every day that we live. You know, I have multiple identities now. I'm a dad, that's my biggest identity. I'm a researcher, I'm, I study war, I'm a husband, all of that, but you know, I'm still every day I'm, I'm living for a purpose and that's what people need to understand. Yeah. Awesome. Great advice. And when they have that clear, it makes a lot of other things really much easier. Absolutely. Yeah. Not because you can focus and get after it. Well, it's uh, been so fun having you here. Tell, please, if you don't mind, tell our listeners how they can learn more about what you're doing. Sure. So I'm, a, I'm big on social media on all of them uh, on Twitter at Spencer guard. I have a website called spencer You can get my books on Amazon. Uh, just look me up and you'll find me. Okay, great. Good. Well, thank you, Colonel John Spencer for being part of this show today. What a great and productive visit this has been. Uh, we certainly wish you the best in all of the things that you're doing. Thanks so much, Steve. Okay. And to our listeners, you have our just the very highest respect and admiration that we could give. Uh, we are honored that you would join us today and join us in this pathway of learning and improvement and becoming your best. And we wish each one of you all the best today and always. This is your host, Steve Schallenberger, signing off.